on nano antimicrobials and we have only two speakers for today and they are the most accomplished professor in this field first speaker is professor vincent rutello from university of massachusetts amherst uh, i believe he is one of the most influential researcher in the field of uh, nanobiotechnology so i basically started interacting with him when i was a phd student at university of liverpool and one thing that i really liked the most about him that he is always very prompt in responding whoever writes to him and usually very supportive uh, when i came back here then we started talking about uh, the applications of some of the materials that we were also uh, working on especially gold nanoparticles and porous gold nanoparticles that i was talking about uh, during my lecture and when i joined lums in 2008 the first foreign visit i made was his group in 2008 at university of massachusetts and since then we have been discussing how can we collaborate effectively uh, to initiate for example nano biotechnology research here in pakistan as well and he has been very helping to me indeed and uh, uh, he basically focuses on the applications of uh, nano particles especially gold in biosensing drug delivery and energy technologies and one of the thing that he is mostly known for is to control the surface chemistry of these nanoparticles to enhance their interaction with the biological system so for this purpose uh, he designed so many organic ligands so like me he is, he is also basically organic chemist and uh, they try to control the surface chemistry of those nanoparticles especially to control the hydrophobic properties and hydrophilic properties and bring positive charge on nanoparticle surface so as i was mentioning before that positively charged particles they interact more strongly with bacteria and definitely the surfaces which which are negatively charged uh, he is uh, at the moment university distinguished professor at uh, university of massachusetts amherst and he has more than 60000 citations and uh, was declared as the most influential scientist in the world by thomson reuters uh, about 5 years before even so uh, unfortunately he cannot come live because like me he sleeps very early and at this time it is midnight there in usa so he was kind enough to record his talk for us and that is what i will be sharing today okay so if you have any questions because he will not be available live uh, i can guarantee that if you write him email he will be very prompt to respond to you so now i am going to share his uh, recorded lecture Hello, everybody. I'd like to tell you about some of the research we've been doing on nanomaterials for fighting antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections. I'll be telling you about some of the work we're doing. First, I'll start off with why it's so important to be able to fight antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Then I'm going to tell you about some nanoparticles we've worked on, some nanoparticles that have biofilm penetration so that we can fight biofilm infections, anti-biofilm capsules, and anti-biofilm nanosponges. So, why are we so worried about it? If you look at the headlines, what you can see is there are a lot of really dire warnings in terms of the dangers of antibiotic-resistant infections. One of them that really jumped that really jumped out at me was a woman in the U.S. died from a superbug that no antibiotic could treat. Every antibiotic in the clinic was was tried, and none of them were able to kill the infection. So the, the woman died. This is something that we're looking at in the future, and. 
this is the reason why the WHO says that antibiotic resistant infections have the potential to be the largest cause of death by 2050. So here's the question. Why is it that, uh, and I, that bacteria are developing this resistance so quickly? Well, they have a lot of tools that they've developed evolutionarily over the billions of years. So first, let's think about where antibiotics come from. Almost all of the antibiotics in the clinic are derived from natural products, either natural products themselves or modified versions of natural products. These, 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 these natural products are weapons that bad microorganisms have used in the billions of billions year old war between bacteria, fungi, and a bunch of other bunch of other organisms. Even we have a certain peptides that are antimicrobial. So if you think about it, bacteria and these other microorganisms are using these antibiotics to kill each other. And anytime you have something killing something else, whatever's being killed will develop defense mechanisms. And the bacteria have developed a couple of really useful, for them at least, defense mechanisms. One is an efflux pump. An efflux pump, what the efflux pump does is it pumps the, the antibiotics out. So poisonous things go into the bacteria, the bacteria pumps them out before bad things happen. The other trick that they have is they have plasmids. They have DNA. DNA blueprints for a host, a wide range of uh, defense mechanisms that the bacteria can shuffle around to produce defenses against different, uh, against different antibiotics. So, like I said, antibiotic-resistant bacteria are a threat. And if you uh, go back to 2004, What you can see, what we did is we did a study where we looked at gold nanoparticles. And these were simple gold nanoparticles that had surfactant-like files on their surface. So in other words, detergent-like nanoparticles. And we had two different versions. We had positively charged on top. We have a negatively charged particle on the bottom. What we found is that the positively charged particle was toxic against E. coli. And it was required about 3.1 micromolars to to kill the to kill E. coli. That was pretty good. The problem was though that lower concentrations were required to kill mammalian cells and the lice red blood cells. So basically, we had a particle that was more toxic against us than it was against bacteria. Plus, micromolar concentrations of gold nanoparticle are enough to turn people purple. So you know, most people do not want to turn colors like that. So these are the very simple particles that we had in 2004. And you can see that they, they didn't have much therapeutic potential. So if we move forward 10, 10 years, what we see is that we've developed a new family of nanoparticles. These new family of particles, they have that same hydrophobic layer near the particle, but outside that hydrophobic layer, they have a tetraethylene glycol layer that provides what we call that provides a stealth functionalization and then we can put functionality on the outside and that's what the outside world sees in other words that's what bacteria will see so in these studies since we found out that the cationic particles were, were toxic but anionic were we focused on positively charged particles and what we looked at is we looked at hydrophobicity if you look at the, uh, the graph on the right, what you see is minimum inhibitory concentration, which is how much particle is required to inhibit the growth of the bacteria on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have the hydrophobicity of the head group, in other words, the log P. And as you go to the right, the head group gets more and more hydrophobic, more and more greasy. And what you see is you see the efficacy of the particle really increases as you go to the right, as you become more hydrophobic. And that is presumably because 
when you have the charge, the cationic charge, they can interact with the negative charge of the bacterial wall, and you have hydrophobic groups. Those can lyse the, uh, the membrane and kill the bacteria. So, it's hard to read this off the graph, but we do have really low MICs. We have nanomolar MICs. And so, that's great, but the one that the uh, graph that we have here is from a laboratory strain. It's non-pathogenic. So, how does our system work against pathogenic bacteria? Well, we have a library of really nasty bacteria. And if you take a look, we have bacteria here that are resistant to multiple antibiotics, including e an E. coli that's resistant to 17 different antibiotics, and a MRSA strain that's, that, that's resistant to 10, and a Pseudomonas that's resistant to 13. And in all cases, we have MICs in the low nanomolar range. So we have a good antimicrobial system. Now, that's part of the issue. One of the things that's going to keep coming up through the course of the talk is it's important to kill bacteria, but it's also important not to kill the host cells. Be so if you think about it, if you want to kill bacteria effectively, you can put bleach on them. But bleach is terrible for treating a, an infection because it kills us as effectively or more effectively than it kills the bacteria. So one of the, one of the ways that you can assess toxicity is you can look at hemolysis. In other words, what concentration is required to make lice or break up red blood cells? And so what you have on the right is you have a plot of percent hemolysis on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you have the gold nanoparticle concentration. What you can see is it takes about 400 nanomolar of the gold nanoparticle to lice 50% of the, the red blood cell. So that means we do have a system that's more toxic to the bacteria than it is to us. Uh, that's good. But the most important thing I think here is that we don't see resistance developed in the E. coli over 20 generations. So that's kind of an interesting, that's an interesting outcome. So one of the questions that you have to ask is, well, what's the mechanism for killing the bacteria? As I mentioned, these hydrophobic particles have the possibility of lysing the membrane. In other words, cutting holes in the bacterial membrane. And we can test that sort of mechanism by doing a dye, basically a dye penetration study. So in this case, in this system, what we do is we use propidium, propidium iodide, which is non-membrane permeable. If you put it into a solution with healthy bacteria, the dye doesn't go in. If you have holes in the, in the bacterial wall, for example, uh, either holes punched or rips cut in them, then the dye can leak in. And so what you see is that with both E. coli and Staph aureus, we see good penetration of the propidium iodide into the bacteria. That's, that's the red thing that you see. So we get good penetration. Now, the exact mechanism is, is a little bit tricky, and we don't know if it's pores, rafts, or other sorts of uh, membrane damage. But one thing we can get it, we can get an idea of what's going on by looking at electron microscopy. And so what we have here are bacteria that we treated with gold nanoparticle. And we have two different bacteria. We have B. subtilisis and E. coli. And what you can see in particular on the B. subtilis, I'm sorry, B. subtilis, is you can see that the particles bind to the surface of the bacteria and they induce Blebbing. In other words, they sort of they distort the membrane. This is suggesting that what we're doing is we are actually distorting the membrane, on the, and that is at least on the way to actually lysing the uh, the, bac the bacteria. So one of the things that we see is that we see clustering in both cases. So these particles appear to act cooperatively. They sort of stick to the bacteria. They aggregate on the surface of the bacteria and they induce toxicity. So, are they sticking to? Well, one of the things that we can see is that if we treat the uh, bacteria with uh, trypsin to chop off the proteoglycans, in other words, the proteins with sugars attached to them, we can really decrease the blebbing, we can decrease the aggregation on the surface of the bacteria. So, this is a really interesting question about uh, 
basically how nanomaterials can interact with the surface of bacteria, which is the glycomics, in other words, the sugar-based research. Now, one of the fifth, next slide, I'm not sure exactly what time in the day my, my talk's going to be, but the next slide is going to have a picture of a human wound biofilm. So if it's near breakfast or near lunch, or you don't want to see, uh, you don't want to see a nasty infection, you should uh, probably skip the next slide. But what I've shown you so far is, uh, is how we can use nanomaterials to treat what's called planktonic bacteria or dispersed bacteria that are floating around. One of the other tricks that bacteria can use to become to resist therapeutic uh, therapeutics and treatments is to formation of a biofilm. And what a biofilm is is basically a structure that bacteria have evolved over the eons to protect themselves. You can think of it sort of like creating a fort or a castle to protect them from other competitors and other microorganisms. So these biofilms are really compl complex and they are a mixture of the bacteria plus sugars plus nucleic acids plus lots of stuff. And they are really difficult to treat. Wound biofilms are a huge health issue. You can see the see, you see example of a foot, foot wound. And these, in this case, what you have is you have a system where the, the antibiotics cannot access the bacteria. The bacteria are tougher to kill than normal. And this is a growing issue because these wound biofilms uh, occur with weakened immune system. They can occur with both aging and with diseases such as diabetes. So. These are bad. The wound biofilms are bad. Internal biofilms are also bad. Tick-borne diseases are believed to uh, be, become very difficult to treat because they form internal biofilms. Now, when you have the wound biofilms, sometimes you can use antibiotics, but often excision or debridement is required. Debridement means cutting off all of that dead flesh. Those sorts of operations are highly invasive. And they, 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 they create health risks all their own. So we want to create systems that can penetrate and treat biofilms. So one of the questions we, that, we, that we asked about five years, five or six years ago is, how can you penetrate this dense matrix of stuff that is, that, 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 that is the EPS or extracellular polymeric substances? Well, we use quantum dots cadmium selenide quantum dots to figure out what can penetrate into biofilms. And so you think about it, a natural hypothesis would be hmm, these biofilms are have negatively charged bacteria, negatively charged nucleic acids. So perhaps positively charged quantum dots should go in. So if you look at the micrographs on the right, you can see that the neutrally charged, neutral uh, quantum dot there's no penetration. So let me explain these micrographs a little bit first. We have a red fluorescent protein expressing bacteria. So the red that you see is the bacteria. We have a green quantum dot. So if you see green, that means you're seeing the quantum dot. If you see yellow, you're seeing the green on top of the yellow. So getting back to that peg quantum dot, you see it's all red, no yellow, no green, meaning no penetration. Same holds true for the carboxylate quantum dot. If you get to the cationic quantum dots, however, you see both yellow and green, depending on the particle you use. So these cationic quantum dots they behave differently. What's that difference? And you can see that if you zoom in a little bit closer. And what we see is if you take a look at the hydrophilic quantum dot on the top, you can see green fluorescence, red fluorescence, and they don't overlay. That means that the green fluorescence of the quantum dot is not inside the bacteria, it's in the material surrounding the bacteria, in other words, the extracellular polymeric substances. If you look at the hydrophobic uh, quantum dot, you can see that you get yellow. That means that the, part, the quantum dot is in the same place as the bacteria. So that says that two different mechanisms are used to penetrate the biofilm. Hydrophilic ones go around the bacteria. Hydrophobic quantum dots go through the bacteria. And this is something similar to what we saw with mammalian cell studies. Now, that's great. 
But you know what? These systems don't, these particles, these quantum dots don't kill bacteria. And even if they did kill bacteria, we wouldn't want to be putting cadmium celadide on or in our body. So, how can we take what we've learned from these uh, studies and use them to fight biofilm infection? So, the first system that we used started with uh, the idea of taking silica nanoparticles, positively charged, and assembling them around a droplet of peppermint oil. And this is a process that's called uh, pickering, uh, makes, forming a pickering emulsion. And the idea we had was that hmm, the quantum dot, the, 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 sorry, the silica nanoparticle will provide the charge that's re positive charge that's required to penetrate the biofilm. The peppermint oil would do the killing. Now, now why peppermint oil? Well, peppermint oil is what's called an essential oil. And essential oils are what plants use to defend themselves against bacterial infection. So they work pretty well at killing planktonic bacteria, but being oils, they will sit on top of a biofilm and they'll have no real effect at killing the biofilm. So if we can use the particles to penetrate the biofilm and then the peppermint oil can kill the bacteria, we've got a nice system for doing antimicrobial studies. So we hypothesized that we had a pickering emulsion, this little blob, blob that you see down in the, uh, on, the, on the cartoon. How do we know that we actually have that four shell type structure? Well, if you go to the micrograph on the right, what, you, what we did for these studies is we took a green fluorophore and we put it on the silica nanoparticle. And then we put a red fluorophore into the oil. And what you see is you can see in the top upper left, you can see the sort of circular structure for the green. That's what you expect to have. It's, it's basically the outside of the, uh, of the droplet. The reds, the red up in the upper right is where you have the oil. And then if you look at the lower right, you can see that hmm, you've got the green around the red, meaning you have a core shell type product. Now, key thing to remember for, for a little bit later on is that what we look to do is we look to stabilize these droplets, these, these pickering emulsions even further by reacting cinnamaldehyde, which is basically one of the, F, one of the uh, scents uh, that's present in cinnamon. We put that in with the silica particles to form uh, shift space with the amines, anchoring that particle to the surface. So that's actually going to show up a few slides later on. Now, first question is, does our idea work? Can these nanoparticles penetrate biofilms? So once again, we take these green fluorophore labeled uh, nanoparticles and we put them in with red fluorescent protein expressing E. coli. And what you can see is you can see when you look at the uh, fluorescence micrographs, upper left pan, we have the, the nanoparticle Upper right, we have the biofilm. When you put them two over on top of each other, you can see the particle is where the biofilm is. Now, a key thing to look at is that side profile that's at the bottom of the micrograph on the, on the, on the lower image. There you can see it's yellow all the way through, meaning that the particles are penetrating all the way through the biofilm. Now, that's great, they penetrate, but are they bactericidal? And what we have in this slide is we have a lot going on. What we're looking at here is we're looking at a pseudomonas, a pathogenic pseudomonas bacteria, biofilm, bacterial biofilm. What we have in the graph on the y-axis is we have the viability of the bacteria. On the x-axis, we have the amount of a 2% emulsion of the various materials that we use. So the, 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 the color that you want to keep track of is black in this case. And what you see is with the black, which is the capsule that has both the cinnamaldehyde and the peppermint oil, we see very efficient killing of the bacteria. So as you go to the right, you see very quick drop off in viability. And that's true actually for both the, one, the, 
particle with the cinnamaldehyde and the particle without the cinnamaldehyde. Key thing to notice is that the silica particle by itself, which is in blue, shows no real toxicity to the bacteria, and the same holds true for the peppermint oil. So this is what we see for Pseudomonas. If we look at other species, what we can see is that not only does our KISS system kill Pseudomonas effectively, it kills E. coli, Staph aureus, and E. cloacea. So our the system is a broad spectrum antimicrobial. So remember what I said earlier, uh, one of the key things we need to be able to do is we need to be able to not only kill the bacteria, but we need to not kill the host. So what we did to look at, uh, at that selectivity in terms of toxicity, we did a co-culture model. And these co-culture models, what we do is we, we grow fibroblast cells, which are, if you have a wound and you look down and it's healing, you can see those little fibrous white things that you see there, those are fibroblasts. And so we grow fibroblast cells, and then we grow E. coli on top of them. We grow a biofilm with E. coli on top of them. Now, this graph is a little bit confusing because what you have on the left-hand side is the log of viable bacteria. So this is colony-forming units, which are basically each bacteria is a colony forming unit. And what you can see when you when you look at the at the red bars that are that correspond to this axis, you can see that we go from log about a little over log seven down to log two. So we're getting a five log unit reduction in bacterial concentration. So a ten to the fifth reduction in in bacterial level. Now if you go to the right hand side that's viability on a linear scale for the fibroblasts and what you find is you find that as you increase the amount of uh, nanocapsule you get increasing viability of the of the fibroblasts and so that's kind of great because you basically have a system that kills bacteria and helps the mammalian cells grow better it was a question that puzzled us though is like why do the why do the fibroblasts grow better so we did a little bit of literature searching and we found that it turns out that cinnamaldehyde promotes an insulin growth-like growth factor signaling. So basically what we're doing is we're turning on the, uh, turning on the fibroblasts while killing the, the biofilm. So that's great, but there's a real limitation to this method. And that is the use of silicon nanoparticles. You know, one of the pro one of the projects that we are involved in in the lab is nanotoxicology. And one of the real questions that always comes up is, well, what happens to nanomaterials in vivo in our body? And that's always, always kind of a question. So one of the things we thought we could do is move away from nanoparticle-based carriers to polymeric carriers. And the great thing about this is that greater diversity, in other words, lots of polymers we can make, lower cost, and reduced, reduced issues of bioaccumulation. So this system is fundamentally different than the, system, than, than the Pickering emulsion I showed you before, because this generates a nano sponge type structure. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, what we start off with is we start off with a positively charged polymer that has a guanidinium, guanidinium groups and amines. These, this polymer is water soluble. Then we, we take that polymer and we put it into water. We mix that water aqueous solution of the polymer with a mixture of carbocrol, which is oregano oil in this case, so another essential oil, another antimicrobial oil, and this maleic acid and polymer, and maleic and hydride functionalized polymer. So what happens when you make that emulsion is you have the polymer, the, the, the hydrophobic polymer and the carbocrol, those form a droplet, and then the polymer, the amine functionalized polymer, reacts with the anhydride, opening up that anhydride and forming a bond. When the hydrophilic polymer reacts with the hydrophobic polymer, it gets pulled into the oil. And you end up getting, instead of a core shell structure, you end up getting a sponge-like structure 
with the polymer going throughout the uh, the, the nano emulsion. And you get an idea of kind of what they look like by the, the transmission electron micrograph on the right, where you have basically, you can see the sort of sponge-like structure. So, that's our hypothesis is that it's sponge-like. One of the ways that we can verify that hypothesis is through microscopy once again. So, in this case, what we did is we put a green dye into the oil, and we put a red dye on the polymer. And so if you look at the micrographs, on the, upper, on the upper left, you have the green dye. On the upper right, you have the red dye. When you look at the overlay, you see it's yellow in the lower left. That yellow indicates complete co-distribution. So in other words, wherever you have the, the, pol the oil, you have the polymer, meaning that the polymer is a network structure throughout the oil. So that's Great. How does it work? Well, first thing we looked at is we looked at penetration into the biofilm. So once again, what we have is we have a green dye. In this case, it's in the oil rather than in the pol on a polymer. So we have a green dye in the oil. We have once again the red fluorescent protein expressing E. coli. When you have that system, what you can see is on the left-hand side you have you can see the green from the the, the oil center, you can see the red from the E. coli. You do the overlay, you can see hmm, complete overlay. If you look at the side profile on the bottom, you can see that they basically get penetration all the way through the, uh, through the biofilm. This is important that you need to have that nano, that nano sponge because without that, the oil just sits on top. So oil penetration, does that provide efficacy? Well, once again, this color scheme is a little bit different. In this case, you want the, the red bars of the treatment condition, and you can see that the nano sponges effectively kill bacteria. If you look at the green, light green, which is the carbocrol oil, carbocrol doesn't really kill the bacteria. The dark green is the poly, blue green is the poly, dark blue green is the polymer. That doesn't kill the bacteria. It's only when you have the nano sponges. So. That's great. The nano sponges are what kill the bacteria. Now, what about selectivity? That's a really that's a really key question. Are we killing the bacteria without killing the mammalian cells? Once again, we have the co-culture. Same co-culture in this case. Uh, what we see is we see if you look at the the biofilm that's uh, axis that's on the right, we're going from. Hmm, once again, about log seven to log two, or a five order, five order of magnitude loss in bacteria. At the same time, we see no change in mammalian cell viability. So that says that we are able to kill the bacteria without killing the, the mammalian cells. We have a good selective system. Now, there's one more issue that we really haven't dealt with. And that is that, remember I talked about the issue of bioaccumulation. In other words, you put the, the nanoparticles into your, into your body, they end up accumulating, and your body doesn't have a great way of getting rid of them. That nano sponge I showed you, that's going to have the same problem because there's no way to, to degrade it. The, the polymers are cross-linked. You, you have this cross-linked network that basically has no real great way of excreting. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a degradable nano sponge. So our thinking was, hmm, what about if we take the same kind of polymer but put in a degradable cross-linking agent? And so that's what we have here. And so we have a very similar polymer that has, once again, a positively charged guanidinium group to provide uh, penetration in the biofilms. In this case, we put a malayamid group onto the uh, onto the polymer, and what that lets us do is that lets us use a thiol crosslinker. So we take this thiol crosslinker that you can see on the lower right hand side, and this features multiple sites of degradability. You have the disulfide that can be cleaved by thiols inside the uh, inside the body and inside of cells. 
and you have esters that can be cleaved by esterases that are present both in bacteria and in mammalian cells. So, the idea here is that this cross-linking agent on the right is hydrophobic, can react with the uh, can react with the malleum in the polymer, forming the same kind of network structure, and then the system can be degraded by this little, like you see with the little scissors, snipping the disulfide or snipping the esters, or even cleaving the malleum in group. So that's that that's the that's the plan, and the system once again gives very nice uh, nanomaterials, nan in this case, nano sponge type systems. You can see that they're roughly 200 nanometers across. So that's great. First question: Do they degrade? And first. Thing we need to ask is hmm, do they degrade when we want them to we want them to be we want these sponges to be stable in uh, serum because we don't want them just fall apart so the top uh, the top graph what you have is a dynamic light scattering plot of the nano sponges on their own in red and then we put them into serum which is in blue and what you see there is you can see the uh, the small peaks to the left, which are the serum proteins. And then if you look at the peak for the, the nanosponges, you can see that it's very similar to the nanosponges in buffer, just a little bit bigger, which makes perfect sense because what you're doing is you're form you're basically some of the proteins are sticking to the outside of the sponges and forming your corona. You get a very different outcome if you look at the graph on the bottom. And in that case, what you have, once again, the red is the nanosponges. And the green is if we put in glutathione, which is a, a naturally occurring file that is basically our body's, our body's redu reducing agent. And when you put, that, uh, you put that glutathione in, you can see that basically the size distribution changes dramatically. And that's because you're basically breaking up that cross-link structure and the oil droplets are, re, are, are basically reforming into different size populations. So you see that change in uh, size distribution with glutathione in green. You also see a major change in size distribution with blue, which is the esterase. So both the thiol and the esterase degrade the the grade the nano sponge. Now, we've learned a little something about uh, looking at uh, biofilm penetration over the years. And we realized that the really important thing to look at, it's important to look at the side view. So what you have here is the side view on these, uh, these systems. So once again, green dye loaded uh, nano, nano sponges on top. The bottom, the RFP, Middle is the overlay. Once again, you can see complete penetration into the biofilm. And you can quantify that by looking at the fluorescence. And so if you, if you look at the fluorescence, what you can see, the key thing to look at is the green, the green plot. And there you can see that we have penetration all the way from the outside to the, to the very bottom of the biofilm. So we have a really good system for, for biofilm penetration. Do they kill bacteria? Well, once again, I give you too many graphs. But what you can see is in this case, the nanosponges are in black. And for each of the bacteria, Pseudomonas, E. coli, E. cloacea, and MRSA, the black it, you follow the black bars and the nanosponges kill the bacteria in the biofilm effectively. Carbacrol in red doesn't really do much against any of these biofilms, which makes sense because, like I said, the oil sits on top of the biofilm. The polymer itself shows very little toxicity as well in, in any of these three bacteria, in these four bacteria. So, what we see is we see hmm, we have really good killing of these of these biofilms. Now, like I, as always, selectivity is important. Are we killing the bacteria without killing 
flailing himself. And here we see even more effective killing of the bacteria. So once again, the log of the biofilm CFU, or in other words, the number of living bacteria is on the, is on the right. And what you can see is we're going from, once again, over 10 to the seventh colony forming units, this time down to 10. So 10 bacteria per milliliter is all that's left. And so we see this dramatic killing of, of the bacteria. And if you look at the green plot of fibroblast viability, there's no significant loss in fibroblast uh, viability over this whole range of concentration. So this is important, uh, and we do have selectivity. But the next slide is, if there's one thing that I want you to remember from this talk, it's this slide because this slide looks at bacterial resistance. And so what we, what we have in this, this slide is on the graph, on the y-axis, we have the increase in dosage that's required to kill the bacteria. On the x-axis, we have number of serial passages. Now, what does that mean? Well, what we do is we take the bacteria, we put in enough of the antimicrobial agent, antibiotic or our nanosponges to kill 60% of the bacteria. Then we regrow. Each time we kill and re we regrow, that's a serial passage. And so let's start off with, uh, let's start off with uh, ciprofloxacin, which is the yellow, the yellow one. What you can see is that with ciprofloxacin, it takes just three serial passages before the antibiotic. We can't dissolve enough of the antibiotic in water to kill the bacteria. So that antibiotic has basically lost all of its uh, efficacy. If you look at ceftazidine in green, you can see that takes six serial passages. If you look at the reds, tetracycline, three serial passages is all that it takes for the bacteria to gain resistance. And so key take home lesson here is that when a doctor prescribes an antibiotic to you, you should take as much as they tell you to take and take it for as long as they take because otherwise you will contribute to superbug generation. Now, let's contrast those antibiotics with our, uh, with our nanosponge. What you see there is that all the way out to 20 passages, there's no change in efficacy. So there is no re resistance to our, to our antimicrobial system observed over 20 serial passages. And if you think about it, that makes sense because our system works by lysing the bacteria. And lysing, to prevent that, the bacteria would have to create different cell walls. So, that's going to be difficult to do, and that's going to be a lot harder than addressing the threat from a specific antibiotic. So, got that on the bottom, next in vivo. What I can say is we are seeing promising results from wound biofilm studies that we're doing in mice right now. So, with that, I'm basically out of time. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you a summary of some of the things that, uh, that I hope you've taken away from this talk. First of all, cationic nanoparticles are antibacterial, and they can penetrate into biofilm. And that's because bacteria are negatively charged. Cationic nanoparticles interact with the walls of bacteria. They can penetrate into the biofilm because the bio components of the biofilms are also negatively charged. So cationic nanoparticles are great. And we use that to learn that hmm, cationic, cationic functionality is what's needed to, to, to deal with the biofilm infection. So, next step, we, we go and we take what we've learned and we put these nanoparticles, these positively charged nanoparticles, on the surface of nanocapsules. And these can be used to eradicate biofilms and simultaneously stimulate mammalian cell growth. Finally, the uh, polymer nanosponges destroy biofilms even more effectively than the nanocapsules do without harming mammalian cells and without acquired resistance. So this is 
really nice place to be, and we think we're in a we're in a we're in a place where we may be able to prove the WHO wrong. So with that, there's a lot of people that are involved in the research, and they've been cited throughout the course. Here's a picture of a group from a little while ago. So the research works because we've got a great group of people that uh, that work really well together. It's a highly collaborative environment, both in the group and outside the group. So if you want to find out more, just drop me an email and I can let you know. And for, for the folks and bums, I, I want to remind you to send your best work to Bioconjugate Chemistry, the journal at the interface of synthesis and biology. So with that, I'd like to thank Urshad Hussein for inviting me to, to give this talk. It's it's better to be uh, virtual than, than than not to be there at all. It would be nice to be in person, but, uh, but, I, but I really appreciate the invitation. And I'd like to thank all of you for your time and attention. So thank you all. I hope you like this lecture. Unfortunately, Rutello is not live to answer to your questions, but uh, as I mentioned before, he is very prompt in responding emails. So if you have any questions, please send him email with reference to this workshop, and I believe he will, he will respond. Uh, we have also collaborated with him So we have also collaborated with Professor Rutello on several projects related to this multi-drug resistance, developing these uh, nanoparticles that can not only detect bacteria in drinking water, but they can also kill the bacteria. Uh, the take home message from his talk is probably uh, when you plan to design these nanoparticles, to kill bacteria, one thing you really need to look into is uh, in addition to controlling the size and shape of particles that you want to use for this purpose, it's very important to control their surface chemistry. So you might have noticed that most of the particles, they have used their ketanic in nature, and that positive charge basically helps to interact uh, 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 these nanoparticles with the negatively charged surface of bacteria. And then, as you mentioned, two major challenges in uh, uh, killing bacteria is uh, uh, especially when those bacteria hide that themselves in biofilm, for example. So for that purpose, again, these cation nanoparticles are very useful, and you can also encapsulate them in nanocapsules, along with some oils, which can not only help killing the bacteria, but also they can improve the uh, fibroblast cells growth so that wounds can easily be recovered. Uh, similarly, polymer sponges were also very useful for this purpose. So again, if you have any questions, I will also be able to, may be able to respond to some of those uh, during tea time after this. I believe we have some uh, tea time today as well because this is the last session of this workshop. And we still have some time uh, for the next lecture, 10 minutes. I'm not sure if Francesco is available here right now to, to start. So we will just wait five, 10 more minutes to start the next lecture. So thank you very much for listening once again. So let us thank Professor Rutello once again for his very exciting talk. Thank you, ma'am, Dr. Abida Raza, and I'm from Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission from National Institute of Lasers and Optronics. So also working in the area of nanomedicines. Just, uh, uh, you know, it's like uh, uh, talking about the uh, multiple drug resistant bacteria. We have also worked with the Acinobacter bomini and isolated the 
um, bacteria from the uh, clinical uh, specimens and uh, checked for their resistance. So the, the same theme we have also followed that the uh, cationic particles uh, can play um, you know, um, uh, a good role in the killing of the bacteria. Uh, keeping in mind the hypothesis that the bacteria are the negatively charged membranes they have, so you can utilize this property for killing the bacteria. And we have, uh, what we have additionally added the, uh, we have used the peptide. And uh, this peptide, uh, um, it was like the, uh, you can also isolate from the uh, VASP because it is the uh, mastopiran and mastopiran also has the antibacterial activity. So uh, you can add there, you can have this energetic effect uh, when you talk about the bacterial resistance. So single mechanism that in the in this uh, you know uh, presentation, as they have used the oil uh, just enhancing the you know uh, the killing mechanisms and killing ability of these bacteria. So if you want to have this energetic uh, effect, uh, you can uh, use one or two, uh, you know, mechanisms simultaneously that you can have a very good uh, result. So we have also induced the, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, we have used these clinical uh, isolates for the uh, induction of the sepsis model in the, uh, you know, in the mice and uh, just injected all these, our formulations into that one and to study the, um, uh, how much the reduction in colony forming units or how much the reduction in the in the bacterial load so uh, this uh, these uh, nanomedicine can really help in addressing the uh, antibacterial resistance because it's very difficult to uh, just uh, develop the new drugs every time and in pakistan especially we are getting the resistance because of the use of the antibiotics because just without any prescription we are using. So we are also uh, just, uh, you know, inducing the resistance in the bacteria. So nanomedicine can really help uh, to design such projects that you can use the, you can have the synergic effect also. And also you can, you know, it's multiple combinations you can have. You can have the uh, uh, polymers in combination with the uh, peptides. You can have the polymers in combination with uh, when you can load the anti antibacterial, you know, antibiotics. You can load, so you can have the uh, you know uh, good mechanism, good results using that one. Thank you. I am Kaisal Mansur from Institute of Biomedical and Genetic Engineering, uh, which is operating under the command of Dr. A.Q. Khan Research Laboratories. A very interesting workshop throughout the first day. Uh, Dr. Irshad uh, has really done a very good job to uh, make all the nanotechnologists, nano uh, technology scientists at one platform. Let's first thank him. Secondly, as uh, the early first uh, lecture today, and uh, similarly as Dr. Abida added on that, that uh, nanotechnology can be used to get biological beneficial, beneficial biological reactions at a very uh, precise rate and at, at a very precise concentration. At Institute of Biomedical and Genetic Engineering, we are also involved with the nano medicine and nanotechnology developments for the use of clinical and biomedical applications. For this, uh, as uh, Dr. Rishad and Dr. Rotello told that the cationic properties of the nanoparticles that, that can be used for the uh, killing of the bacteria. Uh, I want to mention that one of our paper has been awarded as the best research paper award for the year 2017 by higher education commission with the same principle that we used nickel oxide nanoflakes on graphene and the ch ch cationic charge on that particle uh, on that sheets that's destabilized the negatively charged bacteria and almost killed absolutely the uh, multi-drug resistant uh, staphylococcus aureus e coli and pseudogonus aeruginosa and likewise 
Such particles can also be utilized for the purification of water, where free radicals are available, and these simply these particles simply uh, remove those uh, toxic chemicals in the form of gaseous, and the gases evaporate from the water. Uh, and in other uh, case, uh, we are also using them as drug delivery and uh, in case of cancers. Dr. Ashta is here. She is also working on the nanomedicine in, uh, at the Institute of Biomedical and Genetic Engineering. So we have a very good in vitro setup for all these uh, uh, applica studying the applications of nanotechnology at biological levels. Thank you very much. Hi, Francesco. Good morning. Good morning, Ishad. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for accepting our request to deliver this lecture at very odd time. Uh, I believe it's quite early there in Switzerland. It Stick is. It is. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. And uh, this is the last and probably one of the most important lectures of this nano medicine workshop. Uh, so before uh, we request Professor uh, Francesco Stilacci to deliver his lecture, I would like to briefly introduce him. Uh, he is currently professor of material science and engineering at EPFL Lausanne, Switzerland. Uh, I met him in 2009 probably when he was a tenured professor at MIT. And immediately after our meeting, probably after a few months, he left MIT and joined EPFL Switzerland. Probably it was in 2009 or 10? 10? 10, 2010. 2010. So uh, his work is mostly focused on controlling uh, the surface chemistry of nanomaterials, especially nanoparticles. He not only controls the surface chemistry, but in many cases, they have also been very successful to control the orientation of ligands on nanoparticles. And not only, again, orientation, but in some cases, they were also able to control the number of ligands on uh, nanoparticles uh, as well for many applications. That's really important. And uh, uh, he is one of the most prolific researcher in the field of uh, nanotechnology, probably over 20,000 citations in his field at such, an, such a young age. And he is uh, involved in the editorial board of several journals, uh, previously probably for nanoscale as well. And with this, uh, I would uh, uh, request Professor uh, uh, Stilachi to please uh, start his lecture. So, Francesco, please. Okay, uh, so. I hope you see my screen. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay. Um, and now you should also see me. Okay. Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for you. And um, it's a pleasure for me to have the opportunity to tell you this story. Um, what I'm gonna be telling you today about, um, it's something that uh, Irshad, nice presentation, um, fits the very well with, because it's something that really starts in 2010, which is the year where I moved to uh, from the US to Europe, because um, there I decided to have a new line of research. And this line of research is a line of research in antivirals. Um, and um, before I go and uh, tell you why I chose of this line of research and then obviously what I did. I want to start be with by thanking uh, a few key people. Let me ask, do you see my second slide? Are the slides changing in my presentation? Uh, is 
because sometimes it doesn't happen for me. Yes, yes, Francesco. Okay, can... perfect, perfect T-shirt. And the reason why I wanna thank these people is because 10 years ago, um, as Ishad was saying, I was doing well with my career, but uh, and uh, doing nano and so on and so forth. But I honestly had no track record whatsoever in uh, uh, virology and in working with viruses. And so um, this, sorry, this lady here, Silke Kroll, really, um, it's the first one that I need to uh, thank because she decided to work with me. And when I told her, you know, we're going to work in antivirals, she was all ears and um, really understood the importance of working with them and decided to, to share this journey with me. It's easy, you know, at the end of your project when you're famous and so on and so forth to have a collaborator, but at the beginning it's a whole another story. And then we shared these two PhD students, Maria and Marco, and this very, very, very important postdoc uh, that really got the project going. This project wouldn't exist if it wasn't for her. And if it wasn't for this other lady here, Valeria Cagno, who back then was a PhD student of David Lambo, the first virologist to work with me. And I really need to thank him. But Valera decided to dedicate part of her PhD on this project. Then um, she went and did a postdoc for Caroline Taparel, who uh, is here and worked 100% on this project. And I'm happy to say that uh, last month she started her own professorship position um, on this project independent, of course, in the University Hospital of Lausanne, who recently was named ninth hospital in the world. So um, that was a good thing. Out of my lab, Paolo was the first one that started working and making nanoparticles to this project. Marie did her PhD in trying to understand the mechanism that I'll be telling you about today. And Sam is the first one to invent the organic molecule that I will present you, he now has his own group working on this at University of Manchester. Marie was the first one to do in vivo on, on this, and Peter and Leila have done um, simulation on this. So this is the team. But why I wanted to work on uh, antivirals. Let's start by this plot right here. This was my initial driving force. As you can see, if you take um, um, what the UNO defines low income countries, in 2016, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, um, and, uh, uh, and in part sixth and seventh cause of death, where actually cause of death, they came from, um, um, and actually even the first, sorry, um, where cause of death, they came from infectious diseases. So what uh, in politics they call communicable diseases. So these are diseases that come either from a viral or from a bacterial infection. And if we actually look here is viral, 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 bacterial, and then this is viral or bacterial both, and this is mostly bacterial. So mostly it's viral diseases. And, um, and then you ask yourself, wow, what is the situation we have in the world with viral diseases? Well, you can start by a plot like this, where you have all conditions that lead, that are determined by viral diseases. Below, I write the most common viruses that will determine these conditions. In violet, we have the viruses against which we have a vaccine. In red, we have the viruses against which we have a drug. And the full red is really good drugs 
and this is HIV and hepatitis C. The dotted lines are drugs that, you know, are not that good by many standards, but at least we have a drug. What you can see is that there's a lot of black. There's a lot of viruses. They don't have a box. They, we have no vaccine and we have no drugs against them. In this slide is the reason for why 10 years ago I decided to work on this. That is, I decided uh, 10 years ago that I wanted to work on this problem because it looked to me somewhat crazy that uh, nobody um, uh, was able to work on, um, nobody was working on this. In fact, I can uh, state a small number here. In the world, uh, there's about 50% of diseases that lead to death are communicable. But despite that, only 15, and these are data pre-COVID, to be honest, okay? But despite that, only 15% of uh, uh, funds uh, go on communicable diseases of uh, pharmaceutical uh, development funds go on uh, communicable diseases. So there's a huge disparity and I wanted to work on that. Now there is another reason and um, that reason um, I've been talking about in, uh, in the last six, seven years. Um, that reason is something I don't need to explain to you right now, but is that despite um, all of these viruses, there's also new viruses that emerge every once in a while. This slide is old, but you can see in this slide there is SARS, uh, there is MERS, um, and there's a lot of viruses, MERS is here. These are coronaviruses too. But there's a lot of viruses that emerge. And uh, you can say, okay, um, that looks to me a bit too much. It's not. Starting from the 70s, a new virus, a new human virus has emerged roughly every four years. That is, just to be very clear, um, uh, that we have an incidence of new viruses that is every two, three years. Now, one can start to reflect about this, but uh, Irshad said that, that I'm young. I'm not that young. But when I was born, when Irshad was born, HIV didn't exist. Zika didn't exist. Ebola, actually Zika and Ebola existed, but they were not famous. They re-emerged later. Now, there is this second graph that I used to present. Um, sooner or later, I'll replace it. But this is something to say when, when a virus emerges, you never know, you really never know uh, how hard it will hit. This is the average lifespan in the US, in America. And this dip here is, sorry, the Spanish flu. So, um, and just to put it in context, this dip here and this dip here are first and second world war. The most important, the second world war, you know, you know how many people were died in second world war. This is the Spanish flu. Now, I hope that uh, in history, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, will not do anything like this to average lifespan. Even though now I'm starting to doubt that uh, on plots, we will be able to see it. But if we do, it's just because in modern life, the plot is so flat. But if we plot the world economy in 2020, there will be a dip that will go in history and will be recognizable forever. Now, what is the conclusion of what I've been telling you today? Well, the conclusion is that we need antivirals. I hope you agree. I can open up parentheses. We need to invest in developing antivirals. And the third thing is a personal one, is that we need broad spectrum antivirals. 
why would we need broad spectrum antivirus? Well, you know, for a very simple reason, there's too many viruses that don't have a drug. To develop one per each, considering that in the last 100 years, we developed two good ones, um, it will take a long time. The second is, if we want something um, that is, is or should be used for viruses that have to emerge, so for the future, it has to be something broad spectrum because something specific will not work on something we don't know. And as you all are aware nowadays, is that it takes a year to develop a vaccine, minimum. But um, to develop broad spectrum antivirals, you need to understand what a virus is and whether this is at all possible. And uh, here is where my talk will depart from a truly biological talk on a virus. I'm going to take the liberty of actually describing to you a virus in a different way, that is, in a material science way. I'm a material scientist by training. A virus, for me, is a self-assembly. It's a self-assembly of proteins that repeat themselves. That's a capsid. And these proteins contain the genetic material inside and are surrounded by a lipid bilayer, not in all cases. Um, and this lipid bilayer contains membrane proper, uh, pro proteins, okay? Now, in terms of where we stand with viruses, in nanotechnology, if you want, we have a lot of controls on viruses. There's beautiful research where people can take a virus and reconstitute it. That is, they can take the proteins and put them back together. And in fact, some colleagues have been able to put nanoparticles inside the capsid of a virus. Some have been able to synthesize nanoparticles inside the virus. So we have quite a control of that. And so, but at the end, a virus is the most complex biological object that doesn't have life. And um, let's reflect on this. A virus, as I will tell you in a second, can actually replicate. But the virus um, does not feed, does not have a metabolism. So it's missing just one of the two pillars for life. So a virus, it's an interesting thing because it's just a self-assembly object uh, that has these magical properties of replicating, but it replicates as a parasite. So how does a virus replicate? It goes inside the cell, it um, unpacks, releases the material, and at that point, this material released hijacks the living part of a cell, replicates, and then the virus reconstitutes, which I told you before, the object self assembled back together and leaves the cell, okay? Now, here comes the first observation I will pose to you. As I said, the virus is not alive, right? So it is possible in principle to say, okay, let me build a thermodynamics of a virus. That is, here we have initial state and here we have a final state. Initial and final state are the same, but in between we have a transient state, which is the unpacked one. You can point it here before the production if you wanna be uh, easier. Now I could pose you the question, what is the lowest energy form of a virus? The packed or the unpacked one? It's a complicated question, it's a tricky question because if we say it's the packed one, then this process is energy driven, is not spontaneous. If we say it's the unpacked one, then it is this project process, the packing, that is energy driven and non-spontaneous. If you go in virology, uh, the most common uh, understanding is that this is the lowest energy, the minimum, the unpacked, and this is a metastable state. We can accept that, and then the energy landscape of a virus would be like this. That means that why, when entering and unpacking, a virus goes a spontaneous event, 
But this spontaneous event must have a barrier, otherwise a virus would randomly unpack. And, my, and so this is the energy landscape we, we could agree on with a virologist. My hypothesis is the red one, is that upon binding to a cell, a virus lowers the barrier. And this lowering on the barrier leads to a spontaneous event and that of unpacking. And so I thought to myself, well, wouldn't a great drug be able to do what I've done here? go from black to red and force the unpacking, the spontaneous unpacking of a virus, but outside the cell where a fragment of a virus is non-toxic, it's non-infected. That would be a great drug and that would be a thermodynamic drug. And it would be, if you want, if you allow me, um, thermodynamics, put it in every box you want, material science, chemistry, winning over a virus. That was my initial idea, okay? That's uh, to name again, that's the idea I approached uh, Silke Kroll with. Um, now, at this point, uh, a serious scientist uh, starts doing his homework. And so I started reading the literature. What I found in the literature first is that the most common drugs, basically all the drugs you've heard of, more or less, that are FDA approved. They have a mechanism for why, um, against viruses, they have a mechanism that we call antiviral. And these drugs block the replication mechanism of a virus inside a cell. So they are intraviral drugs. These drugs are great, FDA approved, some names have become famous in these days, but these drugs have a very major limitation. And that limitation is that they are virus specific because each virus um, chooses a certain pathway inside the cell, not others. And so these drugs are virus specific and that was not what I wanted. Then, there is another mechanism to fight virus, says, and this mechanism is called virucidal. Now, a virucidal mechanism is, I think, what you've been thinking about. Why don't we go and destroy the virus, right? This is a great idea, if you want, but it's easier said than done, because if you look at the viral replication mechanism, what you will realize is that a virus is made of the same material that the cell, the host is made of. So it is easy, I repeat, it is easy to make a virucidal compound, a surfactant, alcohol, uh, so alcohol or strong acids, they're all vi strongly virucidal. These two is things we use to clean our virus lab but also surfactants and alcohol are things that in these days you have all used to wash your hands and clean viruses. The problem with this is that if you actually think of them as drugs, not as compounds, but as drugs, they will destroy viruses, but they will also destroy the host. And so they will not work. So this approach here is intrinsically limited by the toxicity. There is a third mechanism, and that mechanism is called virostatic. That is, it's a mechanism that is still an extracellular mechanism, but it is based on blocking the viral entry to the cell, for example, by binding to the virus. There is another possibility uh, so how do you bind to the virus? You imitate cell sugars that go to the virus and they block the viral receptor. And so the virus never finds the cell. If you want, it's a competitive assay, if you are familiar with biochemistry. Great idea. There is another possibility, and that second possibility is that of using monoclonal antibody. You've heard this. That is, you block the cell receptors, 
Okay. Monoclonal antibody is great thing, really great thing, but they are specific to a virus, as you've heard in these days. Cell sugars, they're not specific to a virus. So they are a broad spectrum. So a great idea, but there is one problem with this. And this uh, one problem is that this approach has a fundamental limitation that you will find in basic chemistry. Basically, you're running a competitive assay. So what you're doing is you're taking a compound and you're binding it to a virus. But binding, as you know, in biology, in chemistry, sorry, or in thermodynamics, if you prefer, um, is a um, reversible event. So in fact, in chemistry, we would name these things with a binding constant. Now, when the concentration of sugars goes below the binding constant or the concentration of a virus or both, what happens is that you unbind and unbinding leaves a virus that's perfectly intact and hence um, infective to restart the viral replication mechanism. Now, this, if you want, it's um, of course the greatest limitation. But if you forget for a second about that limitation, what you find is that this approach has been known since 1947, 47, um, as a broad spectrum approach. So it works for a lot of viruses and it's non-toxic because it's based on polysaccharides and since 64 on heparin, a very non-toxic uh, polymer that we use as anticoagulant and one can take every day by IV in his or her blood. Why is it non-toxic? Because you're imitating sugars that are already in the human body. Why is it broad spectrum? Because basically every virus has targets a part of our body that is highly conserved. Because if not, we would have mutated already not to have viral diseases. And because it targets a highly conserved thing, that means that their receptor has a highly conserved target. And if I mimic that target, I can get to the virus. And that target, the highly conserved uh, viruses that uh, highly conserved sugars on our cell membranes are basically two, heparin sulfate proteoglycan. And with that, you get dengue, Ebola, herpes, papilloma, HIV, foot and mouse, West Nile, hepatitis B, um, and now SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, or sialic acid, where you get the virus that we're, we should mostly be worrying about because it's the one that has the highest potential to have for future pandemics, and that is influenza. Just two things. All right. This one, this top one is special because to imitate it, you only have to put sulfonic acid on basically anything you want. You can put a sulfonic acid on natural polymers or synthetic polymers on dendrimers on silver nanoparticle if you want. And what you'll get, and on gold nanoparticles too, this is the reference. And what you'll get, you'll get something that will block all of the viruses that I showed there in vitro. But the reversible mechanism will block you to going, will prevent you from going in vivo. But the, the thing is so positive that people have said, okay, the main problem here is the problem of reversibility. What if we avoid that by going topical? And specifically people have said, what if we make a cream, for example, against HIV? And that's what has happened. I think it's around here, this reference here. Anyway, uh, with this approach, they've gone to phase three clinical trials. That's a great success, phase, phase three clinical trials. But they have failed with that. And the reason for why they failed with that is because um, the, the cream becomes a sponge 
for viruses because it's made to bind to the viruses. And it works as long as it's there, but a small lesion brings this virus-rich sponge inside your bloodstream, dilutes it, and releases infected viruses. That's why it doesn't work. Okay, uh, I made a long introduction to explain you really the problem. Then what was my idea, okay? My idea was, if this process is reversible but works so well, can I use it just as a step to introduce a second process that is irreversible? And the second process will be the forcing of a virus to open, okay? How? Well, by lowering this barrier, imitating better the cell sugar membrane. And the cell sugar membrane is not just the receptor that brings me there, but it's actually a, an environment that is very highly hydrophobic. Ishad was in my group for a while and knows that we've developed particles that penetrate cell membrane by having hydrophobic contact. So that's really what my group does is really understanding the importance of hydrophobicity in biology, okay? So if we go and look at the protein that bind to the sugars on cell membranes, what we call the viral attachment ligand, okay? These things have two things that are important. One, like any other folded protein on earth, they have exposed hydrophobic. My lab tries to understand why, okay? But there is no exception to this. Proteins have exposed hydrophobic, okay? When uh, people will tell you a protein is hydrophilic, no, uh, a protein is a complex surface. One. Two, in yellow here, these are the groups, and this is a herpes just, but this is true for all via viral attachment ligand that have been solved by crystal structure. Not many, not many. Well, uh, what happens is that you see there's multiple yellow parts in that protein. That is, they have multivalent attachment. So they don't attach to a cell sugar in one place of the protein, they attach in multiple. This is very common, very, very common. So this is a sketch. And the sketch is done as a sketch to explain you how simple my idea was. My idea was, I will use these compounds to bind to a virus. They will bind multivalently. This was already known before me since the 80s, where they understood better what heparin was doing. So basically, there will be a multivalent bind. All of that is in the literature. But after that, what will happen with my drug is that I will add a lot of flexible hydrophobic ligands. And once I have hydrophobic proximity, what will happen is that there will be a large matching uh, and touching of the hydrophobic part of my compound with the hydrophobic part of a protein. But this to happen, needs to go into a secondary conformation that is different from the primary and is more stretched. And stretching means applying a pressure. And my dream was that that pressure is what the virus is looking for on the cell membrane to actually get the signal to open up. That was my initial idea. Okay, what did we do? We took nanoparticles, coated with octentile hydrophobic and mercapt undecane sulfonic acid hydrophilic. We'd been studying them since 2006, these particles, and we knew they were non-toxic. Non limited toxicity is key, key for antivirals. We're not talking about chemotherapy and things like that. You need to have very little toxicity. And so we had data all the way to peaks that were non-toxic, so good. Importantly, let me go back just one second. They looked a lot like gold nanoparticles that had been published, uh, but they that had much less hydrophobicity. And this is normal because, you know, the credo out there is that to work in biology, you need uh, in medicine, you need 
high solubility, and so let's limit hydrophobicity. So we took them. First thing, we did um, antiviral test. Did they work as antiviral? And we used wild type viruses. Uh, wild type means extracted from a patient and uh, reproduced in the lab only one time. Herpes simplex virus one, herpes simplex virus two, papilloma virus. In all cases, we got um, nanomolar inhibition. That's important for me because nanomolar was the inhibition for the nanoparticle I just showed you, and it's the inhibition of heparin and on many, 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 many other publications. So that meant in my lab, we could reproduce what was done in our labs. That's good, right? Second, um, nanomolar is in this type of test, the efficacy you have for approved FDA antiviral, which means that you are in the right regime to actually translate this. But this slide right here only shows that we were at the same level than the rest of, uh, of the world and of literature. Now, let me explain you one thing. What I just showed you is a dose array response. What does that mean? Uh, we took a certain amount of virus, which in this world is called a viral titer, and we added the different concentration of the drug. And then we waited for an hour and then took this inoculum and put it on cells. If there is no effect on the drug, what you'll see is on cells, many plaques. If you're blocking um, the virus, then you'll see uh, very, very few drugs, uh, blue plaques. That means you're blocking the virus. So here you're plotting the infectivity as a function of concentration of a drug. Okay. From there, what I just told you is the EC50 is the concentration that blocks half of infection. But from the same curve, you can read the EC90 or the EC99. The EC99 is the concentration of the drug that blocks two logs of infection. Now, why did I did this preamble? Because for me, very important is this research question. Am I able to block the virus in an irreversible way? It turns out that there is a test since the 60s for this. And the test goes like this. You take a viral titer, a certain virus concentration. Then you take another sample where you take the same viral titer and you mix it with your compound. And you do that at the EC99, so at the concentration that blocks two logs of infection. As you do that, the sample you produce will infect cells with two logs fewer plaques by definition, because you've chosen that concentration. Then what you do is you dilute your both your control and your sample serially. And typically what you plot is the infection at the last dilution. If the effect is reversible, sooner or later you go below the KD and the compound will detach from the virus. And at this point, you'll have free virus in your sample and in your control. And so at the last dilution, even though you started from two logs difference, you'll end with no difference. If the effect is irreversible, the difference will stay two logs. So what this means is from now on, I will be showing you these type of plots. If you see this, it's reversible. If you see this, it's irreversible. And now I present the most important slide in my talk, which is what we did. We compared heparin, the nanoparticle that were in the literature, and our nanoparticles. Okay. If you look at the red dots, the MTT assay toxicity profile, about the same for all three. If you look at the black curve, the dose array response, first graph that I showed you, about the same for all three. Nanomolar, all three. 
So in a log scale, you won't see the difference between one and 10 and something like that, okay? Um, but if you look here, heparin is reversible. The short ligand, uh, ligand uh, it's uh, in virology, ligand is a specific protein on the virus. So I prefer to say the short molecule, okay? The short molecule on the nanoparticle, reversible. The long hydrophobic molecule on the nanoparticle irreversible. And that's the key difference. And this is irreversible on herpes simplex 2, irreversible on papilloma, irreversible on RSV, irreversible on HIV, irreversible on dengue, broad spectrum irreversible. Now, the dilution assay, you can do it at different times. You mix and then you wait, but you can decide how much you wait. And if you do this test, you see that full irreversibility is only after half an hour. But at five minutes, only half of the irreversibility is and, at, and immediately, you know, it takes sometimes any way to do this mixing, but, uh, you know, rapidly, if you want, there's only 20% of irreversibility. This is very important because it means that the breaking of a virus is an event that happens in minutes. So in, in a sense, it's a very strong indication that it's a complex event. It's not an event that is immediate like binding, okay? Then we can do TEM, and what you see here is that this is herpes simplex virus 2. The black dots are nanoparticle. They accumulate somewhere. That's where the viral attachment ligand should be. That's what I think. And the final effect is the virus broken. And um, we have molecular dynamic simulations that actually show that indeed when the particles bind to this protein, they enlarge it. I will be more clear later about this. And we have very detailed TM studies that show that we first break the membrane by elongating it and pushing the capsid out, and then we break the capsid. But all of this preamble, if you want, was done to tell you that I wanted efficacy in vivo as a drug. If I don't show you efficacy in vivo as a drug, we haven't made much progress. And so the first test was an ex vivo test, which means a test where we did things on human tissues regrown at the air liquid interface. And let's compare the short, league, short molecule nanoparticles with long molecule nanoparticles. Immediately, they both work, but after two days, Half of the efficacy for the reversible nanoparticle is lost and our stays. And after three days, all of the efficacy for the reversible nanoparticle is lost and our is still there. And importantly, our nanoparticle work in pre-treatment or in post-treatment. That's ex vivo. This is in vivo. We also have efficacy in vivo to cure about RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. This is a viral infection that later will turn into bacterial pneumonia and that kills half a million people every year in low income countries. Um, there is no drug, no vaccine against this. One single dose intranasally of our nanoparticle completely cleared the lung of our mice. That was a great result. Okay, I wanna tell you two last things. First, at one point, I posed the hard question for a person like me, do we need nano? And the, the answer is no, because what I just told you is that I need something long, flexible, hydrophobic, multivalent. That's all I need. And so my uh, really talented postdoc, Sam Jones, put the same molecule we put on nanoparticles, he put it on the primary phase of a cyclodextrin, natural colic sugar that you will find in many drugs and that it's also there in Febreze as a freshener. Even in this case, we can make something that um, is um, uh, short or long. The short blocks viruses not so well. 
reversibly, the lung blocks viruses much better, but most importantly, irreversibly. And it does so in a uh, broad spectrum way. And in this case, we can very easily do what is called a DNA release assay. So to show, not that just we're just breaking with nanoparticle with CTM, but we do a bioassay, and the bioassay shows that this cyclodexin forces herpes simplex virus 2, one of the most stable, stable virus we know, um, to release uh, DNA. I'm going to open just a small parenthesis. The most stable viruses we know are waterborne viruses, the one that give you diarrhea. And my approach will not work on those viruses. I'm, I'm talking about the hours. This uh, is a simulation that really shows what happens. Um, these are the three parts of a protein that bind to our cyclodextrin. And this is the rest position. And this is after they bind to the cyclodextrin I showed you. And you can clearly see that the screen expands, uh, that the, the proteins expand. This works in vivo, uh, exactly as well as the nanoparticles. And then the next step was, can we actually make this whole process work against the other family of viruses? That is the one that targets sialic acid. And we did that. We put our target molecule on cyclodextrin and we got very good broad spectrum data showing again nanomolar efficacy against a, really a bunch of influenza virus. And in this case, we could do reversible, reversible and irreversible molecules that bound to a virus that they were very, very similar. This time, not even the length is different. It's only the hydrophobicity. And the irreversible worked ex vivo, the reversible did not. And um, I'm going to conclude with some spectacular data we got from NIH. Uh, that is, uh, we showed in vivo that our uh, product worked in a head-to-head -head comparison with oseltamivir, which is anti-influenza drug that maybe you've heard under the commercial name of Tamiflu. Um, now, if you look at Tamiflu in uh, uh, co-treatment, okay, we have a cohort of mice that was given H1N1 California 9, a pandemic uh, version of a virus. In this cohort, the placebo lost all of its mice, but one, so one survival, to the, uh, to the influenza. Oseltamivir, given at 30 milligram per kilogram per day, when you gave it in co-treatment, that means you gave oseltamivir at the same time you gave a viral challenge, saved all of the mice. Our compound at 10 times less, given intranasally, saved seven mice, okay? 10 times less, we saved seven mice, pretty good. But now we go 24 hours post-infection. That's what we would call therapeutic use. It's more significant if you want, because you don't get a drug when you get the virus, you, you wait for symptoms. This time in the placebo, all the mice died. Um, but this time, oseltamivir, same way, also all the mice died only one and a half days later. What does that mean? It means that oseltamivir needs to be given very soon in the infection because it's an intracellular drug. And intracellularly, once the inflammation is too high, your drug stops working. But at three milligram per kilogram per day, at 24 hours, we saved four mice. So seven, four. We were almost at the same efficacy uh, at 24 hours. But importantly, if we go to a dose of seven and a half milligram per kilogram, at 24 hours, we save nine out of 10 mice. And because of a placebo one and zero survival, plus or minus one is the error in this measurement. 
So basically, we say the whole cohort at a, a dose that is one fourth, more or less, of uh, oseltamivir one at 24 hours post-infection, which is importantly, which is when you have symptoms. Okay, I'll close here. I need to thank the Vernon Siemens Foundation that very generously decided to fund this work. I need to um, also the NCCR Bioinspired that funds this work, the Swiss National Science Foundation that funds this work. And most importantly, I need to thank my students that work on this now, Matteo Gaspari, Yong Zhu, Francesca Olgiati. This is my own personal antiviral dream team. They work hard even during the pandemic to really get these things going. I'm um, very privileged to work with students like that. And I need to thank you for your attention. Is anybody there? Sorry, my mic was off. Ah, so, okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Francesco, for a wonderful talk. We really appreciate that. So now floor is open for questions, initially for people who are physically present over here, and then we will take some questions from the people. Online. Who are okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Can you please come over here? Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for your nice talk. Thank Am you. I... Can you hear, Francesco? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, please go ahead. So my question is regarding the biological activities of your uh, formulation because being a pharmacist, we are like mostly concerned or oriented with the biological activities. So can you comment that how far is this that can you somehow like perform in the future some biological activities for a certain formulation? Thank you very much. So of course you've seen we have in vivo data and this in vivo data is telling us that uh, seven milligram per kilogram per day is saving the whole cohort. Um, much more than that in uh, in vivo activity, I cannot comment. In terms of formulation, the luck of uh, that we have um, is that uh, we we have um, 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 compounds that are very highly water soluble, and so for now we have no formulation. If you want, it's just the molecule in water that we give intranasally. Okay, thank you, Francesco. Professor Stilacci, one, one question from here. I'm Kessel uh, from uh, Institute of Biomedical and Genetic Engineering. Sir, so, you have uh, mentioned about human papilloma uh, virus. Uh, I've been working with the recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. And uh, the, it's very hard to uh, proceed, proceed, uh, proceed for the uh, recurrent surgeries. Uh, even at the interval of one week or two weeks, there are too many surgeries, but still we don't have any antiviral or anti uh, 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 laryngeal papillomatosis or recurrent respiratory papillomatosis uh, medication. What is your experience at Switzerland and what are your recommendations for such clinicians and surgeons who are uh, uh, taking the headache of surgically removing this uh, papilloma? I would say in the strongest possible way, I would love to collaborate with people with you and try to see whether my Thank drugs you. could work on that. That's Thank my, so I don't have any immediate recommendation, but I'm open to any uh, collaborations. Uh, I, will, I will show you sir, the, the data I have uh, uh, with the active patients. And uh, unfortunately we have one, two deaths uh, with the patients, uh, the small kids up to the age of 10. And we are really worried about such uh, patients with the recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. And because we are, act our surgeons are actively involved in treating those patients. Absolutely. Even at, at the late nights even. 
And uh, let me tell everybody, I've seen people uh, in the chat have asked me for my email. My email is the simplest possible. It's my name, Francesco, dot my last name, Stellacci, at the name of my university, APFL, dot, the only thing you have to remember is CH, which is the international code for Switzerland. Francesco dot Stellacci at EPFL.ch. I really uh, looking forward to collaborate with people that have problems with vital problems that are unsolved. Um, that's why I went in this business 10 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, thank you, Professor Stilaji, for a very nice talk. Uh, my name is Hira Khaled, and I'm a PhD student uh, from Tianjin University, China. So I have a question for you. Uh, I want to know that uh, some of the viruses have high mutation rate. Uh, if your compound is showing a broad spectrum, so can it stop the viruses having high mutation rate? So my answer is that um, it will depend on the virus. So on paper, it's designed to be mutation resistant. We have shown that in terms of um, um, herpes, we have very strong mutation resistant, but herpes is a DNA virus, so it doesn't mutate that much. Um, we have good data on some uh, RNA viruses, but more data needs to be done. But by design, this thing should be mutation resistant then nature can always surprise you. <laughs> you see what I mean? But uh, I would say I'm optimistic that we are better than what's in the market or in research right now. Whether we will beat the problem, that's a whole another story. Thank you so much. Okay, so any other question from the audience? Yes, here, please. Hi, Professor. Hi. I'm Mohinder, and uh, I would like to ask a question about your uh, uh, research work that uh, the anti uh, virals basically, they are not universal. So as you have uh, talked about them, that can, how universal they are? My first question is, second, is that, is it still on research scale or can it be, how quickly can it be transferred to industrial scale? Like how, can be implemented as an innovation. Thank you. You're asking a very difficult question, my friend. Um, um, that uh, what I what I mean by that is, um, we are doing important steps, uh, hopefully, to move towards going in the market. Uh, as you know, these things are expensive things and we need to find money uh, for that. Um, hopefully we will find them and do big animal studies, big animal toxicity study, and then clinical trials. Thank you. So any other question from the audience? So there are no more questions from the audience. I just have a uh, a little question, Francesco. You showed that you have used some uh, sulfonic acid-based ligands that were probably 10 or 12 carbons? 11. 11 carbon atoms. So have you tried to change the length of that to vary the so, hydrophobicity and see So in shot, in shot. My answer, um, you will understand my answer more than anybody probably. Okay, because I know you, you've been in my lab. Okay, so I showed you that three doesn't work, 11 works, okay? To actually make that experiment was so difficult because it's very easy to make the nanoparticle with three carbon, the nanoparticle with 11 carbon. For the paper, what was very difficult is to make it exactly the same size. Yeah. And, uh, okay, so um, now we are doing very systematic studies Seems counterintuitive, shot, but we're doing them with a cyclodextrin, where um, being a molecule is more 
it, it, the synthesis is immensely more difficult, but once, and we take an us here, you control it perfectly, then changing the ligand uh, most changes the yield of a reaction, you see. Uh, in nanoparticles, to make the whole series with the same ligand density, the same size, the same distribution, very, very difficult, okay? Now you want to collaborate with us and you send me all of them. I'll, it'll take me one week and I'll tell you that the exact result and will be a beautiful publication. But while it's easy to say, oh, let me tell you, let me discover what is the legal length cutoff for the reversible effect. To actually do the experiment cleanly that you're convinced that it's only the legal length is no, no other parameter. That's not so simple, okay? Yes, I understand. So, took us for a long time to do three and 11, long mm -hmm. time. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. If you, as you have already done to initially prepare particles with the octane th thiol. See, see, see. And then replaced by ligand exchange. with. Uh, so we, we are trying that in my lab. Uh, You're much better than us on that. Uh, it's just shorter ligand seems not to replace octane thiol. Yeah. But, uh, but you don't necessarily need to start with what you need to start with something else, maybe that you can replace with all of them. Uh, you see, or maybe start with what or replace with something else, some that then you replace with the others. You see, it needs to be creative, but it's, it's not just a snap of a finger, you see? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it might be definitely impossible to control the same number of ligands if you are doing this by ligand exchange. For example. So I don't see any uh, relevant question from the people who are attending virtually, except that many of them, they want to collaborate with you. <laughs> so they you can know, send email sure. to you, yeah. You were in my lab when this whole thing started. You know, I, I yeah, you yeah. know, nowadays it's popular on SARS, on, uh, pandemics but you know from the very beginning my point has been let's go deal with so many viral diseases that affect developing yeah. countries populous countries um and i need collaboration in these collaborators in these countries if i want to address that problem if not you know rich people will pay always for to cure themselves yeah yeah that's true so I just want to uh, uh, let the audience know that Francesco has always been very cooperative, uh, especially to me in collaboration. And he was the one actually who introduced me to Coast, Professor Usman. Indeed. Bak. Yeah, yeah. And our collaboration has been very successful over there. So if you are really good researcher and you want to collaborate with him, you should have some solid idea and i'm sure he will he will help so with this we would like to thank francesco once again thank you very much francesco uh, for giving such a nice talk at very odd time in uh, swiss i'm gonna go get a coffee as soon as we <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much once again francesco. so bye 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 So with this, I think it is done. Okay, over to Sabrina. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Um, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Stilachi for his time and wonderful talk. On behalf of ComStech team, I would request Professor Dr. Fashid Hasnan, advisor ComStech, uh, for his closing remarks for this event. Thank you, Hazima, and uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. We're coming to the end of a what can very, I think, honestly be described as a very successful, a very high level, and uh, even probably the word exciting should not be inaccurate, uh, workshop, particularly in the present circumstances. 
And uh, before I go to the pleasant duty of thanking everybody who has been involved in uh, presentations and organization, etc., let me say a few words to you as someone who himself has uh, been associated with the field of nanosciences for probably 15, 16, if not 20 years. Uh, of course, from a rather different angle, the angle of uh, physics and the materials. But uh, as I will say in a, a couple of, uh, a little later, uh, I did come to overlap with the area of nanomedicine through uh, my work on magnetic nanoparticles, which are, are used and are at least uh, being researched to be used for both uh, diagnostics as well as therapeutic purposes. So let me uh, sort of put the whole discussion in a slightly broader perspective. All of you, of course, all of us as scientists work rather narrowly focused on our own areas and our own themes. But it is good to uh, have a slightly broader overview, particularly in a area like nanomaterials and their applications, because this is now obviously a multi uh, disciplinary approach that you have seen demonstrated in the various lectures that you have heard. And as you may have experienced also in your work, there is the physics angle or the dimension of the work, which basically works at the fundamental level of how the mainly electronic properties or you could say thermal properties, et cetera, change as a function of the very small size of the material or nanomaterial. And that manifests itself basically in the uh, energy level schemes of the, of the particles, of the electrons within the particles, the phonons, et cetera. And that in turn reflects itself in various properties within the particle. For example, Dr. Sharp mentioned about the uh, surface plasmons, which is a particular uh, manifestation of the size having an effect on the optical properties. Similarly, the magnetic properties, which are very important for some medicinal uh, applications as I mentioned, therapeutic as well as diagnostic, they depend sensitively on the size the outer layers of the nanoparticles become non-magnetic with decreasing size. And that sort of connects to the chemistry. And the chemist, of course, looks at the chemical properties and how the surface is modified. When a surface is modified in a nanoparticle, surface, of course, as you know, is the key role, the key element at that level, which is why you have the functionalization. That is the surface bondings are broken, the surface activation energies are changed, and so the surface functionalization becomes a much more different thing than in the bulk. So the chemist enters the picture and enables the functionalization of particles or other materials for application purposes. And that, of course, is a lot of the discussion that you heard about from in this, in this uh, workshop about how people are trying to develop different levels of functionalization. And then we come to the, you could say the biological side or the uh, medicinal side, which again was the theme. And that becomes a more complex issue because then you're talking about the interaction between the nanoparticle or nanomaterial and the human body and the tissue and the pathways within the body, the blood streams and most importantly, I think I'll say a few words about that. The transmission across the membranes within the body, diaphragms within the body, which is a main issue. So I'll come back to that in a second. But so let's just sum up this part of the point, and that is you have to be able to have an understanding at some level of the various dimensions of nanomaterials, the physics, the chemistry, and of course, then if you are into the biology or then, of course, the biology and life sciences. And then, of course, if you look into it uh, in a broader dimension, the, the computer scientists and the mathematicians enter the picture because now they are trying to make models to understand, to simulate how nanoparticles uh, are transmitted within 
certain barriers of the body. So it would be my suggestion to those who are practically into the field that not only should you uh, stretch out towards different disciplines and try to form larger alliances of chemists and uh, biologists and um, physicists, even as at a very practical level, it is not really feasible for individual groups in countries like ours to be struggling on their own. You have to think about forming larger consortiums, which are target oriented, which are focused on certain problems, whether it is multidisciplinary uh, consortium or group, or whether it is uh, uni uh, disciplinary, uh, you know, group of several groups of chemists, several groups of uh, life sciences people. That is not the main the issue is that we do not have and will not have in the near future resources where individual groups can succeed at attacking or successfully any serious level problems. You can keep on publishing and you can keep on getting citations. It will not really make an impact. So that's one thing that I just wanted to uh, share with you. Just with regards to the theme of this, uh, this uh, workshop that is regarding the uh, nanomedicine, I was just looking through some of the topics and uh, browsing on my own. I found that obviously the, the, some of the, the issues that you should be tackling and thinking about is not only about the development of functionalized materials for therapeutic purposes or uh, diagnostic purposes, you can inject nanoparticles of iron, for example, in the body, and you can use them for both therapeutic purposes, like using them with RF uh, uh, stimulation to burn tumors within the body. And you can also, of course, use nanoparticles for imaging purposes. So whatever dimension used, the problem comes in distribution of nanoparticles within the body. Do they reach the designated sites? How are they distributed within the body? What, and particularly that I mentioned in the beginning, the problem of the crossing of the barriers presented by the membranes within, uh, within the cells and across the cells and across the intestinal uh, barriers, et cetera, the placenta, wherever. There are barriers within the body, within the cell, that it is a major topic of discussion and research. What which particles, what size particles, what functionalization is better, more suitable for the uh, process of diffusion across the barriers presented by the membranes. This requires again also modeling and simulation based on the data. This also requires, of course, understanding the chemistry as well as the biology of the bodies. I'm sure it's a very exciting area, which many of you probably be looking into or should be looking into. So anyway, with that, I come to uh, what little bit I had to say about uh, uh, the thematic discussion. So finally, it's my uh, great pleasure to thank all of those people, the learned scientists, professors who woke up at uh, uh, ungodly hours in their own countries to make presentations and excellent, outstanding presentations. So thanks to all of the, our external uh, guests, presenters, as well as the local Pakistani presenters. Thank to for all of you from Comstec. And of course, thanks to all the participants, those who have come from outside the city, as well as from within Islamabad. Thank you very much in these uh, difficult circumstances. You have uh, uh, chosen to come and participate and uh, grace the occasion with your presence. We thank you very, very sincerely. And of course, hope that you will continue to be part of our, our uh, activities in the future. Uh, it is, of course, a great pleasure to acknowledge the two people who have worked the hardest to make this the success, Dr. Ishad Hussain, who is here. I think he deserves a round of applause for his uh, seminal efforts here to organize this event. And my colleague, Ms. Khazima Muslim, who seems to have managed uh, Okay, for her uh, tireless efforts to make this successful. And indeed, the entire team at Comstech, 
the administration of Comstech, uh, the people who run the guest house and have boarded you and uh, cared for you, the people in our IT department who also have to work very hard to make this event a success, the people in finance who have to run things. So thank, so let's acknowledge all of them also with a round of uh, applause. And so with that, I, I uh, would take my leave. Thank you very much for your kind listening. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind words. With this, I request you to please uh, give certificates of appreciation to our speakers present in person in the auditorium. Uh, may I request Professor Dr. Irshad Hussain to the stage, please. Professor Dr. Raza Shah. Professor Dr. Najamul Haq. And Professor Dr. Muhammad Yar. Thank you very much. Thank you to all our speakers again. Uh, participants can receive their uh, certificate of participation from the registration desk and the virtual participants will also receive their e-certificates through emails in the coming days, inshallah. And with this, thank you very much again for your participation. The tea is served outside and good luck to you.